Welcome to the 24th annual Miami Jewish Film Festival, one of the world's largest and oldest Jewish cultural arts events. We want to thank all of our members, sponsors, community partners, volunteers, all of you film lovers, and especially our presenting sponsors, the Center of the Advancement of Jewish Education and Greater Miami Jewish Federation for their continued support throughout all these years. My name is Batia Cohen. I'm excited to be moderating a virtual conversation with director Kevin Kelly and producer Mary Wells. From the movie Stout Hearted, George Stout and the Guardians of Art, which is premiering at this year's festival. Thank you all for joining us. Well, I'm really uh, glad that we can do this. And my first question actually is where did the title come from? How did you get to that title? Tell us about it. Well, Marie came up with it, so she should talk about that. Um, George Stout, of course, is the subject. But as we began studying uh, the subject with the art conservation people, the monuments men and women that uh, played a part with so little support, particularly at the beginning, and even today, uh, there's a lack uh, sometimes of the support that these people uh, need. I thought they're, start, they're very stout hearted, right? So we tried the uh, title for a while and thought of others and then settled on it. We thought yeah. it was a go. Right. And a lot of times with documentaries, you know, you have a subtitle with the title, um, but we wanted a strong title. So, um, so the public could be interested in the film and the, the subtitle for the librarians <laughs> who would know what the film was about. Because a lot of time with documentaries, you don't know what, what the film was about. So that's why we came up with the subtitle, The Guardians of Art, because they really are uh, the curator or the conservators, and of course the monuments, men and women, and in the Blue Shield that's part yes. of the film, are truly guardians of art. So it kind of worked, we thought, yeah. pretty well. Yeah. I, I think it's a great documentary. How right. did you come about to the topic in general? How did you come interested sure. in it? Yeah, I, uh, I have to give uh, credit to uh, the former uh, museum director at the University of Iowa Museum of Art, Sean O'Hara. He uh, worked on a film with me about Jackson Pollock's mural, which is a large uh, painting that the collection owns. And uh, when we were finished with that film, um, he goes, I know what your next film's going to be. And I go, oh, OK. I hear that a million times now. i got a great idea for you for a film. But, it's my uncle. Yeah, it's not, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he said, uh, you should do a documentary about George Stout. And I didn't know who that was. And I'm from Iowa, and he grew up in Iowa and went to school at the University of Iowa. And then, of course, went on to Boston, where he, where he lived the rest of his life. But I, uh, I started to ask more questions about it. He said, He's the, he was the leader of the Monuments Men. And, of course, the George Clooney movie had just come out. And I thought, oh, I love that story. Because I I'd seen uh, the John Frankenheimer film about the train with Burt Lancaster, about stolen art and being an you know an art student and a, a lover of film, um, I was interested in that. And then um, of course the the book Rape of Europa came out, which talked about Hitler and his museum and all that sort of thing. So I thought, wow, this is this has got everything a movie needs. It's got excitement. It's got a great villain. And, uh, and it's, and it's, it's uh, something really important culturally. So we just started to do work on it. And uh, I guess what really, I think the linchpin for me was when we started to do the research and see if we could actually even do this sort of project, I contacted um, Robert Etzel, who is the author of The Monuments Men and Lynn Nichols, who is also the author of uh, Rape of Europa. And they both agreed to do it. And so once we got an agreement from them, I said, then we can do this project because everybody else was fairly excited about it anyway. And I knew that they, those two would be maybe hard to get, maybe not interested in doing this, but they were both, Robert Etzel called me back within maybe 45 minutes. So that was great. So he was very excited. So yeah. Amazing. Yeah, or emailed me, I guess. 
I, I have another question. What was the most surprising story that you found while making the film? Like anything in particular, like both for both of you? It's got to be Modico. Mm -hmm. uh, we went because she uh, drove out to Detroit area to interview uh, what we were told was the last surviving monuments woman. And uh, this little tiny uh, Asian woman opened the door and invited us in and uh, offered us tea in her little apartment. We sat down and, you know, there was memorabilia around. And then suddenly she started uh, with the camera rolling, telling her story. And it was just like an explosion inside uh, her whole story and how relevant it is now with, um, with immigration and uh, citizenship and uh, government and fascism, right? And so it was, it was, we just loved her. She died, you know, uh, but we were able to uh, keep a uh, light touch with her and she was quite a go-getter, uh, uh, was still writing a book when she passed away. So that was, do you think that would be the most? Yeah, Monica was, was, was just, uh, she was gold, you know, when we met her because, we couldn't, most of the monuments men uh, had either passed on or they were in, there was a lot of monuments men and, and, yeah. and the United States wasn't the only country that was doing this. And so there was several of them, but not a lot lot that were connected to George Stout that worked in his company. Um, there was maybe one, but I don't even know if they really actually worked together that was still alive when we started the film and then he, he passed away a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So, um, but Modico was George Stout's secretary. And as she likes to say, he would call me the kid in the office. <laughs> and of course, she's an American who was deported to Japan during World War II. And after the Europe uh, World War was winding down, um, George Stout had to go to Japan and do sort of the same sort of thing that he was doing in Europe during World War II. Yeah. So, yeah, her story is amazing. I, I've never heard of her, and, and I learned through your documentary about her uh, about her life and, and what she did. And um, did you tell you how did she came across uh, George Stout or anything like like that? Like so, nothing because yeah. I, all of a sudden she tells us that she is working with him. So right, yeah. What, what um, she, you know, um, she didn't have real distinct connections about everything in her life back in those days. But she basically what happened is she got a job with the government as a secretary. And so then she was assigned to that, um, to that office where Scout she, was working. Because of course she was raised here and was, her whole family was deported. Yeah. Uh, and she was an American citizen and uh, they scooped her up because she was bright and she knew both languages very well. So she was an integral part of filing, uh, arch uh, archiving the, the, the mm -hmm. monuments and uh, bits, I mean, samurai swords and all kinds of things, the, the temples and trying to make sense out of an area that had uh, absolutely had the devastation of the war and uh, so that's that's what yeah. she did. Yeah, because ba basically their job there was similar to what it was in France and Germany and wherever they went, uh, and it was to um, protect uh, antiquity from looters, and um, sometimes even in Japan from American GIs who want to take some souvenirs back home. You know. Yeah. So. You know, this is somebody's great great grandfather from the third dynasty, and they want to take it back to Ohio to you know, have it in their basement or something. That, that, that wasn't gonna happen with George Stout being in charge. So they made sure that everything went back to where it belonged. So the best they could anyway. In your film, you talk a lot about the difference between conservation, preservation, and all of those terms that probably like the, the audience do not know enough. And I think you make a good point about it. I don't know if you wanna extend on that. Uh, the knowledge that you got from those things. <laughs> yeah. Well, conservation is trying to keep a work of art alive. 
So when you walk into a museum, it looks like it did, hopefully, you know, after it was created. Best can be, you know, some of these are, you know, hundreds of years old, maybe a few thousand years old. But um, so what the, the new conservators do, they use scientific technique to keep things um, preserved. So it lasts uh, by, you know, using the wrong chemical combinations or a process that could destroy a work of art, it could be worse than doing anything at all. A lot of time there was, was it preservation where they would uh, just paint over a Michelangelo with like a, a blue, you know, <laughs> or something, you know, to try to make it look like it was okay. And um, even though there is some of that, um, there's a lot of study that goes into these, these pieces. Um, before they begin. So I have a lot of respect for these, these conservators. They're just, they're really brilliant people. And of course the history of it is quite long uh, starting in Europe. I mean, is where it started, but the whole uh, vision of Harvard to create a department for art conservation was quite fascinating. We felt very honored to mm -hmm. talk with uh, Francesca Boer Yep. who uh, wrote her book on the history of Harvard's department. And like any other academic department, of course, there was intrigue. <laughs> and it was kind of interesting uh, finding out the politics and the driving forces to push it forward and how uh, George fit into that. And um, it was just, it was, it's fascinating for anyone who's interested in art or art history. I would highly recommend seeing how uh, from from a little ripple, a uh, little stone dropped in the ripples that are still happening uh, within art conservation. And it still goes on. It's very um, intriguing. Uh, the uh, We went to an art conservation uh, seminar, big conference, and oh, to, yeah. to find out oh, uh, all these people that are quite studious, once things start, you know, and they'd, come, they'd go apart and then you'd hear kind of the, well, that will never work about whatever the latest theory is. And uh, yeah. you hear that in John Asmus's right. story with the uh, using of lasers. So yeah, it was, it, was, it was great. We had a great time. It was one of the first things we shot. It was like a Star Trek convention for highly educated <laughs> art conservators that were really pretty brilliant people. Yes. And uh, boy, they really know what they're talking about. And we, you know, we got uh, an earful uh, from a couple lighting specialists about a certain museum, which I won't talk about, but uh, how, how they needed to improve uh, the presentation and they went on and on about well, that. Even the protection of the art, yeah. they thought maybe it, there was a little too much direct or indirect sun mm -hmm. that would cause, uh, I always thought it was mood lighting in these museums. It's like, oh, this is great. And then I found out there's actually a practical, a very practical reason that right. some of those rooms are quite dark. Uh, it's just to protect those beautiful colors that were applied to canvases yeah. many years ago. Right. Yeah. We learned a lot from that, from that uh, I, I, conference. I that, that your film, actually it, it, it follows George Stout's life, but it goes from the past to the present and today's art world and preservation and conservation and all of that, which is amazing because it, it opens up a whole new world for all of us. It's really a, a wonderful job. I, I loved it. I think that, that you did a great documentary. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I read somewhere where, you know, George Stout was very, uh, uh, I guess, modest man, didn't talk about his experience with the monuments men for years, several years. And what he wanted really was this, this, um, um, this system of conservation and preservation to move on. And, and he wanted it, he wanted it to continue. And so um, that's why I was so happy to be able to talk with the contemporaries that we had in the film, because I think George Stout would be, would be very happy that we, that we did that. It wasn't just about him, yeah. but it had to be about him because he got to start somewhere and, and he was a really terrific man and he's got a wonderful family. We know most yeah. of the Stouts, his, his, yeah. his children and, uh, or his, well, one of his son, grandchildren yeah. uh -huh. and nephews. So, and they came to the world premiere 
uh, which was from a little town in Iowa where George Stout was born called Winterset. And there was a movie or a book written called The Bridges of Madison County about these covered bridges with starring Clint Eastwood and Meryl Streep. And uh, so we were able to premiere our, our film there uh, that night and the Stout family came and it was in an old historic um, theater that was built, started, I think it was built around the 1920s or 30s. So that was kind of um, poetic that here they had preserved the actual theater that this film was premiering in. And I think George Stout would be really excited, happy about that too, so. How long did it take you to make the whole film from the idea? <laughs> yeah. Somebody asked us that once. We were like trying to figure that out. I think we I think we started in was it 16 we decided? We we, we really started uh 4 years before uh yeah, 4 oh, years right. before it premiered. Yeah. It, it took a lot of research and thinking about it. Yeah. And of course, we were still uh, working, uh, both of us at the university then. And so we could only work on the side a little bit. Then once we retired, it really amped up. Yeah, that was great. We yeah. had time to, to, to do what we you know are doing now as yeah. filmmakers. We're retired from the university and now that's just what we do full time. So, yeah. but yeah, I think it was like, I guess we could say like four 16. years, mm -hmm. four years, took four, four years. years to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, with documentaries, everybody works differently. We um, went out, did some interviews. I actually wrote some narration, I have a narrator, which never worked out. And then we uh, ended up um, filming some things, editing, coming back, editing, and then going back out and filming again. So it was just this, you know, back and forth process. And then we finally finished it up, I think in the summer of 19. I guess, I guess it was. Yeah, it was the winter like just before it. Oh, yeah, that's we right. No, that's right. Editing. Yeah, that's right. No, you're right. Because we had the premiere in the spring, right? Yeah. So that's kind of a roundabout answer. I hope that answered your question. We'll just say four years. <laughs> so, for example, when, when you go to the to that um, convention, uh, was that something that happened or you were planning to do that? Or how did that end up? <laughs> We, we got lucky because it was, uh, it was, uh, they were having an annual, I forget what there was like this, I don't know what it was like, maybe the 30th anniversary the or AIC, AIC is, the, is, the is, is the conference. And um, it happened to be in Chicago. It was in there. Chicago, which is like nothing for us to just drive over the river and, you know, we're there and we could, we could film it and uh, stay with our friends that live in town and everything. So it kept the budget down. And, uh, but that was one of the earlier things we filmed. Yes, and it opened it up yeah, we met and Connie. made us slow down because then yeah. we realized how much more right. research and study we needed to do to put all the pieces together. But two things really fun happened at that conference that, I don't know if you remember this, but one was we met um, Nairan Kandikar, who was the Nairan, curator yeah. at the Fog Museum. And he basically said, I'm George Stout of today. And we're like, whoa, we well, gotta talk yeah. to you. So he was in he was in Boston. So we, we we made a trip to Boston later, and the other uh, surprise was there is uh, one of Stout's uh, crown jewels was the Ghent altarpiece that was stolen, and the Nazis had put that in a um, um, salt mine and and kept it down there. And they actually had they had conservators, Nazi conservators, yeah. taking care of that painting, which I just thought was kind of creepy, yeah. but kind of interesting. And um, so Stout found that, that piece, and now it's being preserved. And guess who was at the conference? The guy that was conserving the Ghent Alder piece. So we got to talk to him too. That's, in, that's uh, I don't know if you noticed that, that person in the film too. That was, uh, remember his name was this, uh, Bart. Um, can't remember Isn't that terrible names. that we can't, can't remember. remember his first name? Yeah, but it was fabulous, and he yeah. he, had, he did give us a, a great interview. And so to be able to uh, interview quickly this young conservator, we we dragged him in from the hall into a little room and said, "Sit down and talk with us," because <laughs> right. uh, it would have been too expensive for our budget to go yeah. over there yeah, to the see Austin's, him yeah. work. But we're he's so to us, it's like. You're so young. How did you get this such an important job to preserve your country's uh, cultural heritage? 
that's embedded in this piece. And he goes, I happen to be Belgian and here and a conservator and that's what they were looking for. And I go, how did you feel? Because of course the conservation, which is done now was done so that people could come and watch. Yeah, that was interesting. And if you can imagine working close up on this beautiful priceless piece of art and having tourists behind you behind they were like behind glass, glass though watching, so it wasn't like they could walk up to you him know and bother him while he's like but still yeah. so you know if anybody's done artwork you you usually don't like people watching you while you're doing it's okay for them to watch afterwards right but he said he kind of laughed he goes yeah it kind of kept me sweating for a while but then you eventually get used to it it was a very great interview yeah he was yeah. great what a great story it's it's amazing so do you do you have anything in particular that happened during the filming of the documentary or any any surprising moments that you had <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh yeah we got a bunch, of, oh, got a bunch. Yeah. Here, here, here's one we can tell about on camera um the uh <laughs> we went out to uh well okay so leslie stout marx is the granddaughter of george stout and she has one of his paintings and she was talking about how old it is. It's from the 20s. And because George Stott was an art student when he was younger. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I guess we kind of know some people that can fix that painting up for you. Because we, you know, we went to this conference, made all these contacts. So I called the president and said, who is your uh, top people out on the West Coast? Because she lived like in the, in the Bay Area at the time. And uh, they go, well, we've got somebody in Sacramento that's, that's pretty good. And so I said, well, I let Leslie know about it. And I said, can we film you taking George Stout's painting to a conservator and have them do work on it? She goes, sure. And they lived out yeah. in that area. So right. it was perfect. Yeah, we have relatives that live out uh, there. So it was also a family trip. We went out there and stayed with our, our my brother-in-law. And so uh, so we we followed them to this little, uh, just this little tiny, office where they did art conservation. It's a working and, shop. It oh my really gosh. is. You know, it looks like it looks like an auto garage across from a Hardee's. And then you go in, there's these Dutch master paintings and all this know, really amazing stuff. And... You know, you, sometimes you never know what's inside of a building when, when you go to a city. And so uh, we go in and uh, we started filming and uh, the lady was looking at it and uh, she put on her white coat and her gloves and her helmet. And I just thought this was looked really cool for a film, you know, so we're filming it. And, and she's basically saying at the end of this thing going, There's our, this has already been conserved. There's nothing I can really do to improve this painting. And we're, and we're like, like what? <laughs> and so it was like, it was like, of course it is. It's George yeah. Stout's painting. He's going to fix it up himself. Yeah. Before. He, he was retired yeah. and he goes, I'm going to give this to my grandchild. So maybe I'll uh, clean it up a little bit and, yeah. and before I give it to her. And right. it was, so we went, oh, of course. It was from 1926. And that's how old the painting was. And she said, it's in excellent condition. Yeah. So the and paint's was, really solid on there. And painted while he was at the University of Iowa while he yeah. was dating his bride-to-be and it is what was the inscription for oh to his uh it was to his mother-in-law his future mother-in-law future mother -in -law. so it was a very old-fashioned romance right. that he was painting the scene that we guess uh was from the park the city park we have in the mm -hmm. winter yeah, and just uh, off campus here yeah yeah so, so for his future mother-in-law, we thought, oh, really good cute. lad. <laughs> but I mean, it was, you know, there's a lot of things like we've got some older paintings and there's this thing called crackage, they call it, where you look at the paint that's cracked and flaking. And we've actually have a painting that's from the 50s that's got that, you know, so it hasn't yeah, the been crack conserved. So we might have yeah. to take it out to San Francisco ourselves someday. So. Um, <laughs> you should take advantage of your connections. Like that's <laughs> Yeah, really. Right. Yeah. I think the biggest internal surprise was um, the passion I felt uh, when I realized we all have to be concerned locally with cultural preservation. Uh, we really had our eyes open to the fact that we have buildings being torn down. We have uh, old theaters that are being torn up. And of course, that's 
our heritage here, we, we were the vaudeville circuit. So old uh, old vaudeville houses that turned into movie op theaters. Old opera houses. Old yeah. opera houses, which are what uh, in Iowa we have. And of course, in Miami, you have that beautiful deco district that preserves yeah. a time and a certain uh, love of a certain line and design. And if that's gone, that's a part of our history. and. We need to own our history, right? Yeah. So I agree. And, and it's very hard to preserve those kind of things and buildings and, and stuff like that. That is part of our, our of our culture and everything, of course. Mm -hmm. So you do a, a wonderful job doing this kind of documentary, which makes us aware of it. So yeah, I thank you for that. And I don't know if you want to say something uh, to wrap everything up or anything in particular that you want to share. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess that um, I, all I can say is, especially if you're in Europe at an art museum and you go to Europe to, to one of the large art museums, like in London or Paris or wherever, you got to realize that a lot of that art in there was protected by these people called the Monuments Men. Yeah. And there's, there's also these, as Marie calls them, these, these invisible wizards in the, in the back room that are keeping those paintings to look fresh and they yeah. work every day very hard so that we can go in and enjoy enjoy this artwork and it, it will um, not disintegrate and so just it's just something to think about when you go into an art museum now it's like there's there's these faceless heroes yeah there's there's a lot of people that are uh, especially in in europe i know we we didn't have of course um that happen in our country but uh during world war ii um, a lot of the museums when we were in yeah. London at the was a National Museum. The mm -hmm. guy was he had they didn't have a mar little markers of ones that were <laughs> innocent. I go it's crazy. So yeah. with the bombing of London, which paintings would have been, you know, uh, moved or had to be protected? And they said <laughs> the guy said simply, "Well, look, look at the date yeah. and anything past 1940 mm, was in peril." And I, I would look at something, huge paintings, and then go up and look and go, oh my gosh, this was another one that that could have been bombed. I wouldn't be looking at it today without uh, the protections that it received. Yeah. So. And of course, the Blue Shield, I want to give a shout out to them. They're you know connected yeah. with the Smithsonian, and we, we showed uh, part of our film there for training at the Smithsonian. Um, when was that? It was uh, in April. In, the, or, yeah, in April. Yeah. And so... Um, yeah, and so those folks are out there every day, all over the world, protecting cultural heritage, you know, mosques and temples and and all sorts of things that you know, military operation. You know, we, you know, it's an awful thing to have happen. But if there's a way you can work around it, you know, so things can be preserved, you know, that that's really critical. I think for all of us, it's all of it's. Cultural heritage just belongs to it's all of us. human heritage. Yeah, it's human heritage. Yeah. yeah, right. Well, once again, thank you very much. Uh, thank to our members as well, sponsors, community, partners, volunteer, all of your film lovers again, and especially uh, for our sponsors, the Center for Advancement of Jewish Education and the, and the Greater Miami Jewish Federation for their continued support throughout all these years. And thank you, of course, for the audience and of course, uh, Kevin and Mary, thank you very much. And uh, well, thank you for participating in the 24th annual Miami Jewish Film Festival. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us.